So, uh, my talk today, as you rightly say, is on Winston Churchill and some of the paradoxes and ambiguities of uh, his notion of Anglo-America, a subject, uh, a rich historical subject in its own right, but also one which in some ways has considerable uh, contemporary and, dare I say, unresolved resonances. Towards the end of the 19th century, which insofar as it had belonged to any nation, had belonged to Britain, Rudyard Kipling wrote two poems which remain essential reading for any student of the Anglo-American special relationship. The first, published to coincide with Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee of 1897, was recessional. But instead of celebrating, as might have been expected, the greatness and majesty of Britain's far-flung empire, with its dominion over palm and pine, and on which the sun never set, Kipling drew attention instead to the transience of earthly power and the ephemerality of global dominion. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. A year later, he produced The White Man's Burden, a poem in a much more upbeat vein and intended for a very different audience. Addressed to the American people and sent directly to Theodore Roosevelt, who would soon become president, Kipling's purpose was to urge the United States to take unabashed advantage of their recent conquest of the Philippines and to play a bigger and perhaps brasher part on the world stage. It was, Roosevelt opined, rather poor poetry, but very good sense from the expansionist viewpoint. During the course of the 20th century, the respective histories of the United Kingdom and the United States followed precisely the trajectories which Kipling had so presciently sketched out for them in those two works. The British Empire, after a final extension in the aftermath of the First World War, duly went into recessional mode, beginning with the independence of India in 1947 and effectively ending with the return of Hong Kong to China, exactly 50 years later, on the 100th anniversary, indeed, of the Diamond Jubilee. Meanwhile, as the British were letting go, Uncle Sam did indeed oblige by taking up the white man's burden, thereby succeeding John Bull as the greatest power in the West. In part through his crucial intervention in the First World War and his more sustained involvement in the Second, in part because of his increasing military might, economic strength and cultural dominance, and in part through a host of new global agencies which he financed and influenced and in some cases controlled, among them the United Nations, NATO, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The United States, as in the world of Madeleine Albright, is one indispensable nation. Thus were Kipling's poetic predictions borne out while the, the 20th century unfolded as one great English-speaking power succeeded another and without a single angry shot being exchanged between them. Yet, for the Americans on the way up, this was clearly a happier century and a happier outcome than it was for the British on the way down. There were many Britons on both the left and the right who deeply resented the ruthlessness and completeness with which it seemed the United States had superseded the United Kingdom as the greatest power in the West and indeed in the world. There were others who believed that Britain's decline could be postponed and its influence sustained by holding close to the special relationship in which Britain played Greece to America's Rome, offering, so this argument ran, experienced guidance and worldly wisdom to the new but naive global colossus, and thereby perpetuating a disproportionate amount of its own influence as well. And then there was Winston Churchill, the Yankee Marlborough, with a British father and an American mother, whose wartime collaboration with President Franklin Roosevelt was a high point in Anglo-American amity and who believed for much of his life in the unity of the English-speaking peoples as the best way of preserving British influence and of promoting peace and progress and prosperity throughout the world. But as so often with Churchill, there was also another story to tell, not so much of rhetoric and romance, but of reality and real politik which casts a more nuanced light on his evolving attitudes towards the United States and on his handling of the Anglo-American alliance during his two periods of supreme power. Before 1930, Churchill found many aspects of American life and culture and policy distinctly uncongenial. And even during the heyday of the US-UK alliance during the Second World War, his ardent Atlanticism was never fully reciprocated uh, in Washington. 
From 1940 to 1945, Churchill often found the Americans far more difficult to deal with than he would later admit or write about. And in the ten years after, those divergences of opinion and also of resources became even greater. In short, Churchill's relations with America and America's relations with Churchill were more complex and also more interesting than the latter-day image of him as the man who in his own person embodied the union of the English-speaking peoples might suggest. And it's about that and about those issues that I want to talk this evening. Born in 1874, Winston Churchill grew up in a period of late 19th and early 20th century diplomatic rapprochement between Britain and America, when the rivalries and resentments of the previous hundred years were gradually being put aside. And that rapprochement was not only diplomatic, and some would also say based on a growing awareness of a shared racial identity, it was also social and cultural as well. One sign of which was the growing number of impoverished British aristocrats who sought rich American heiresses to bolster their own dwindling and declining fortunes. In this activity, the Marlboroughs were preeminent, for Churchill's father and cousin had both ensnared American heiresses, respectively Jenny Jerome and Consuelo Vanderbilt. And the first time he himself visited the United States, Churchill was obliged to deny to the awaiting pressmen on the New York dockside that he too had gone there in search of a rich wife. <laughs> Churchill made two early visits to America in 1895 en route to Cuba as a war correspondent and again in 1900 as a Boer War celebrity in search of lucrative lecture fees who would soon be taking his seat in the House of Commons. Up to a point, he found the experience both educational and exhilarating. This is a very great country, my dear Jack, he wrote to his younger brother. They make you feel at home and at ease in a way that I never before experienced. Although the grandson of a duke, Churchill was in many ways, was compelled to be in many ways, a self-made and self-supporting man. And there was much about the freedom and openness and opportunity of American society, which he greatly admired. And as both a lecturer and as a celebrity, he seemed able to establish an easy rapport with the press and with much of the American public. So it was perhaps unsurprising that Beatrice Webb concluded on first meeting him in 1903 that the Yankee strain was uppermost and that Churchill was, in her words, more the American speculator than the English aristocrat. Churchill hoped to visit the United States again during the 1900s, but the pressures of politics and of world events prevented him from doing so. Like most Britons, he was overjoyed when the United States came into the First World War on the Allies' side. He made speeches up and down the country, praising President Wilson and welcoming the American troops to Britain and to Europe. So far as I can see, he observed in one of these grandiloquent orations, the great branch of the human family which speaks the English language and whose wide estate covers the greater portion of the habitable globe has reached complete unity of moral conception and practical aims. Not surprisingly, when the English-speaking union was set up in London shortly after the war, Churchill was one of the founding figures, and he spoke in characteristically high-flown terms about permanent brotherhood and comradeship between Britain and America. But for all its early appeal to him as an opportunity society and as a wartime ally, Churchill did not entirely warm to America in this stage and phase of his life. In, contra in contrast to what Beatrice Webb suggested, he was too much of an old world aristocrat for that. After all, the United States had been created on the basis that all men were equal, that deference and nobility were alike unacceptable, that hereditary titles were outlawed, and that monarchy should be abolished. These were not sentiments to which Churchill was ever sympathetic. He also concluded that American politics were deeply corrupt with a vulgar press, an irresponsible democracy, and excessively powerful party political machines. American businessmen impressed him little more. The relations between capital and labor were more bitter than in any other modern economy, and industry and finance were in many ways as corrupt as American city politics. Churchill had also discovered, especially on that second trip, his lecture tour, 
that what was undeniably an English-speaking nation was also, in fact, a much more varied and diverse country of immigrants, and as such was full of substantial pockets of vociferous hostility to Britain and its empire. The Catholic Irish, some of the Dutch, and some of the Germans, who in fact heckled Churchill uh, on occasions on that first lecture tour. These criticisms of American society and politics in no sense lessened Churchill's gratitude for American military help during the First World War, but they inevitably qualified it. Moreover, as a national and imperial patriot, Churchill was not altogether happy about this sudden assertion of American military might, which could threaten Britain's global preeminence even as it had recently helped uh, to preserve it. And as a firm believer in what he regarded as the stable, ordered, layered European society, by what he characterized uh, as forms and ceremonies, institutes and symbols, he did not altogether warm to President Woodrow Wilson, the self-styled champion of democracy, morality, and self-determination, and the enemy of tradition, monarchy, and empire. Indeed, by the late 1920s, Churchill had become deeply and retrospectively hostile to what he now regarded as Wilson's intolerant idealism. And as the subsequent volumes of his World Crisis come out, you can trace the evolution of Churchill's views of Wilson, which do become uh, more critical and hostile along the way. And it was that same weakness for naive, overbearing, and as Churchill saw it, a bigoted utopianism, which was responsible for another American evil that to Churchill was scarcely less dreadful, namely prohibition. <laughs> what sort of a nation could it be that had declared the consumption of alcohol to be illegal? Sometime in the late 1920s or early 1930s, while prohibition was still on, uh, Churchill made his views very plain when, I think for particularly mischievous purposes, he invited a group of American Mormons to lunch at Chartwell. Uh, and the Mormons attacked uh, the orange juice and the sparkling water with enormous enthusiasm, and Churchill treated the brandy and champagne with no less vigor and appreciation. And at some point during the course of the lunch, it is alleged that the senior Mormon turned to his host and said, Mr. Churchill, uh, the reason I do not consume alcohol is because it combines uh, the kick of the antelope with the bite of the viper. Churchill turned and fixed him with a wickedly beatific smile and replied, all my life I have been searching for a drink like that. <laughs> the rest of the lunch is not recorded, it's fair to say. These deeper concerns of an old world conservative for new world zealotry were reinforced for Churchill by the international politics of the 1920s. During those years, there were arguably only two effectively functioning great powers, Britain, whose empire was now larger than it had ever been, and the United States, which had suddenly appeared and erupted as a new force on the world scene. They had been allies at the end of the First World War, but now they were sliding precipitously from friendship to rivalry as what appeared to be an ever more arrogant and domineering America seemed to be challenging Britain for world supremacy, classically exemplified by its refusal to write off Britain's extensive war debts, which caused enormous annoyance in Britain in the 1920s, and by America's apparent determination to challenge uh, Britain for naval rivalry. And Churchill was much involved in the public discussion and political handling of those issues, uh, and they annoyed him very much. Indeed, so annoyed and intransigent about America was Churchill that during this period he actually went on record in cabinet as saying that the United States was fundamentally hostile to Britain and that war between the two nations was far from being unthinkable. If the Conservatives had won the general election of 1929, Churchill had hopes of being moved from being Chancellor of the Exchequer to the Foreign Office. But Clementine, his wife, considered this unlikely. I'm afraid she revealingly remarked, and remember for much of their lives, her judgment was a great deal better than her husband's. I'm afraid your known hostility to America might stand in the way. In the end, the Conservatives were defeated in 1929, and so the matter was never put to the test or to the proof. But no one, peering into the future, would at that date have predicted 
the Churchill would soon emerge as the self-styled champion of Anglo-American amity and English-speaking unity. And so the question to ask is how, why, and when did this very significant change in his worldview actually occur? In 1929, and again in 1931 to 2, freed from the cares and burdens of office, Churchill paid two lengthy visits to the United States. The first, it bears repeating, in nearly three decades, and they transformed his views. For the first time, he journeyed out to the West Coast and obtained a much more vivid sense of the vastness and abundance and potentiality uh, of the country spanning a continent. Despite the fact that these were the years of the Great Depression, he was impressed by the scale and sophistication of American industrial production and noted that unlike Britain, the most able men now seem to go into business rather than politics. All this may help explain why he suddenly became convinced that the United States, as the richest and most productive nation in the world, would prove the prime impetus to economic recovery and to leading the world out of uh, the Great Depression. And he went even further, insisting that it was only by joint action on the part of the English-speaking peoples that we can hope for a revival of the wealth of nations by establishing stable values and regulating the commercial traffic of the world. During the 1930s, this became Churchill's one big idea. And he gave it validation, and it found appropriate expression in two otherwise very different literary enterprises. The first was an essay in what would now be termed counterfactual history, in which he sketched out an alternative picture of North-South and also Anglo-American relations, which started from the presumption that the South, not the North, had won the Civil War. By 1905, Churchill predicted there would have been being two separate but peacefully coexisting United States of America, the South governed by Woodrow Wilson and the North uh, by Theodore Roosevelt. And in that year, so he went on to argue, they joined Britain and its empire, led by Arthur Balfour, in a new English-speaking association. The doctrine of common citizenship for all the peoples involved in the agreement was proclaimed, Churchill hypothesized. And such was the worldly power and moral authority of this Anglo-American alliance that the attempts by the Kaiser to make war in Europe nine years later were easily rebuffed, prevented, and snuffed out. Thereafter, he went on, the glittering spectacle of this great English-speaking combination dominated the globe to humanity's uh, inestimable benefit. In 1930, this was all, of course, complete counterfactual fantasy. But Churchill spent much of the rest of his political life uh, trying to make it reality. His second and much more substantial literary enterprise was to provide an account of the common past of Anglo-America in a history of the English-speaking peoples. The books were not finally published until Churchill was well into his retirement in the late 1950s, but they vividly demonstrate how his thoughts were de developing during the late 1930s when most of the books were in fact written. As Churchill saw it, the English-speaking peoples meant essentially the United Kingdom and the United States. Not much else uh, really got a look in. And he believed their shared history unfolded along a predestined path to the great democracies, with outstanding events along the way, Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, which on this somewhat idiosyncratic reading was not so much a manifesto for the separation of the United Kingdom and the United States, but a defining document which would eventually become part of their own joint heritage. As Churchill saw it, this majestic edifice of Anglo-American friendship was built around the growth of freedom and individual rights under the law. Of these ideas, he told his research assistant, Maurice Ashley, in April 1939, the English-speaking peoples were the authors, then the trustees, and must now again become the armed champions. Thus, in a sense, was already sketched out the strategy he was soon to pursue uh, during uh, the Second World War. Yet during the 1930s, this was not a cause which aroused much enthusiasm on either side of the Atlantic. In the United States, isolation had by then sunk deep roots. Roosevelt's main concerns were domestic, and he was advocating a period of bold and continuous experimentation, reinforced by a visceral hostility to the established order, which found little favor in British official circles. Insofar as he gave much attention to Britain, 
he embraced a Wilsonian dislike of its monarchy and empire and thought that the British were simultaneously too wealthy and too weak and too infirm of purpose. For their part, the British were convinced that the Americans harbored predatory ambitions regarding their empire and that their leaders simply could not be trusted. That was Stanley Baldwin's view and it was also Neville Chamberlain's which helps explain why he rejected FDR's admittedly ill-thought-out peace initiative so contemptuously in early 1938. Nor, despite his vigorous espousal of the cause of Anglo-American amity, was Churchill wholly happy with how things were actually developing in the United States. By the 1930s, it's worth remembering, he was in the most conservative phase of his political career, whereas FDR was at his most radical and Churchill was publicly critical of the New Deal, especially what seemed its irresponsible determination to run a budget deficit and its strident attacks on big business and the old social order. There was then, despite Churchill's own view of things, nothing at all predestined about the Anglo-American alliance as it eventually evolved during the course of the Second World War. Official opinion in Britain did not regard the United States as a dependable ally, and official and public opinion in America had no wish to be involved in another European conflict, least of all another one to preserve the British Empire. Indeed, from this perspective, Churchill's call for an Anglo-American alliance was not, as he saw it, the highest expression of the preordained unity of the English-speaking peoples. On the contrary, it was neither a relevant policy nor a remotely realistic proposal. Of course, it's true that when war broke out and Churchill returned to his old position as First Lord of the Admiralty, that he began to correspond with Roosevelt. But they were not personally acquainted. They'd only met once before, and Churchill couldn't even remember the fact that that had happened, much to Roosevelt's annoyance. <laughs> it was the president who took the initiative in the correspondence, and during the early months of the, their exchange of letters was desultory in the extreme. Only when Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940 did their correspondence move into a higher gear. For with Hitler triumphing in so much of Europe, Churchill was clear from the very beginning of his administration that the only way Britain could win the war, as distinct from survive it, was to draw the US into the conflict. I mean to drag America in, was one of Churchill's phrases from that time. And even when Russia became Britain's co-belligerent in June 1941, that opinion still held good. Accordingly, for the first 18 months of his premiership, Churchill did everything he could to woo, captivate, and cajole Roosevelt. Hence the constant transatlantic allusions in his speeches, as in the peroration to the one ending, this was their finest hour, where he held out the prospect that the whole world, including the United States, would sink into the abyss of a new dark age if Hitler vanquished Britain. Hence his lavish praise of Roosevelt in his broadcasts, this great man, this thrice chosen head of a nation of 130 million people. Hence his burgeoning and carefully crafted correspondence with FDR. Mr. President, he wrote on one occasion, the one decisive counterweight I can see to Hitler would be if the United States were immediately to range herself with us as a belligerent power. And after a slow and hesitant start, it began to work as Anglo-American cooperation drew ever closer in 1940 and 1941. The Destroyers for Bases deal, Lend-Lease, the first meeting of Churchill and Roosevelt off Newfoundland, and the subsequent signing of the Atlantic Charter. To Churchill, as he told George VI, this meant that Britain and America were now walking out together and that their eventual union could not be long delayed. But this was easier said than done. FDR thought Churchill was a Victorian Tory and reactionary imperialist, while Churchill regretted Roosevelt sometimes showed ominous signs of Woodrow Wilson's naive and intolerant idealism. And each time the British gained help from the Americans, it came on very tough and stringent terms. The Destroyers for Bases deal obliged Churchill, much to his regret, to give the Americans a blank check on the whole of our transatlantic possessions, and most of the destroyers were incredibly old and not much use. Lend-Lease was a lifeline, but it meant the British had to part with their gold reserves held in South Africa, and Roosevelt just sent a destroyer to kind of take them away. And the Atlantic Charter, with its call for all peoples to live under governments of their own choosing, was a classic formulation of American anti-colonialism, 
and could thus be interpreted as a direct threat to the survival of the British Empire, where the majority of people certainly did not live under governments of their own choosing. Nevertheless, the next phase of the war from December 1941 to September 1943 marked the high point of the Anglo-American alliance and of the Churchill-Roosevelt relationship. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, Churchill rushed to Washington and delivered a triumphant address to Congress. It's one of the few great speeches of the Second World War where you can actually see him delivering it, and it's a bravura uh, performance. The President and the Prime Minister spent a great deal of time together, and whatever their reservations about each other, they clearly relished each other's company. It's fun, FDR later telegraphed Churchill, being in the same decade with you. Churchill was able to persuade the Americans to accept his vision of grand strategy, namely that the defeat of Germany should take priority over the defeat of Japan, and that in Europe the initial Allied effort should be in the Mediterranean rather than opening a second front on the Atlantic coast of France. And when Churchill returned to the United States in the early autumn of 1943, his hopes for the deepening and perpetuation of the Anglo-American alliance were high. On receiving at Roosevelt's prompting an honorary degree at Harvard University, he urged that the temporary Anglo-American alliance might become the foundation of a common citizenship. I like to think Churchill went on, of Britons and Americans moving about freely over each other's wider state, with hardly a sense of being foreigners to one another. But while this was for Churchill, the working out of his most cherished hopes for transatlantic cooperation and collaboration. This was not the whole picture, and it certainly wasn't how Roosevelt saw things. For there were disagreements about strategy within the Grand Alliance, and as the relative military strengths of its members began to shift, this was not to Britain's advantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. In Europe, the Americans increasingly tired of what they soon came to see as Churchill's obsession with the Mediterranean, in particular the Eastern Mediterranean, not all that far, of course, from the Dardanelles. And they began demanding the opening of a second front uh, in the North Atlantic. In Asia, the fall of Singapore and, of course, of Hong Kong um, and large parts of Malaya and Burma was a bitter imperial humiliation for Britain. And thereafter, the Allied war effort in the Pacific was overwhelmingly carried on by the Americans. Moreover, for his part, Roosevelt became increasingly convinced that he should have direct dealings with Stalin, and thought Churchill, with his long record of strident anti-Bolshevism, was more of a hindrance than a help as a go-between and an intermediary. And the American pressure on the British to advance their empire, especially India, towards self-government continued unrelentingly. Indeed, when Churchill made his ringing declaration at a later Lord Mayor's banquet in London, I have not become the King's First Minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. Those comments were intended as much for Washington and Moscow as they were for Tokyo and Berlin. One of the many ironies of Churchill's position in the Second World War, that he ends up with allies who in some ways were no more friendly to the British Empire than his enemies. From the autumn of 1943, the balance of power between Britain and America within the Grand Alliance swung ever more towards the United States in terms of military force as well as economic might. This irreversible change made it much harder for Churchill to get his way, part cause and part consequence of which was that his relations with Roosevelt deteriorated significantly. At the Tehran conference, FDR deliberately distanced himself from Churchill and set out single-handedly to charm and to court Stalin instead. Throughout 1944, there were constant disagreements between the two of them uh, over Italy, over Greece, over the invasion of the French and Mediterranean coast. Thereafter, Churchill was sometimes, but not always, more skeptical of Stalin than Roosevelt was. But at Yalta, he once again found himself sidelined with, as he saw it, the two leaders ganging up against him and ganging up against the British Empire. And while on Roosevelt's death, Churchill gave a Periclean tribute in the House of Commons, acclaiming the greatest champion of freedom we have ever known, whoever brought help and comfort from the new world to the old, he decided at the last minute against attending Roosevelt's funeral, a sure sign 
of how far their friendship had cooled and a great missed opportunity for getting to know the new president, uh, Harry S. Truman. Of course, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that despite these disagreements, the Grand Alliance did defeat the Axis powers, that Anglo-American collaboration was the closest component of it, and that Churchill had been proven right in his basic assumption that Great Britain might survive alone but could not win without the active military involvement of the United States. What is more, although in political and military terms, Churchill never had better than a weak hand, and it was a hand that weakened as the war progressed, he had played it very well. Despite American opposition to his Mediterranean strategy, Britain consolidated by the end of the war its position in Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq, and, and acquired a whole new area of informal empire, Liberia, and in some ways, Turkey and Greece as well. And although the Americans had not wanted to go to war to save the British Empire a second time, the fact is that it was largely thanks to them that Britain got its Far Eastern Empire back. But the difficulty and the disappointment for Churchill was that as in 1917 to 18, but even more so as a result of 1941 to 45, the Anglo-American relationship was intrinsically and increasingly asymmetrical and that far from embodying or portending the eventual union of the English-speaking peoples on the basis of their shared language and law and history, as Churchill had always hoped it would be, it became instead the means whereby the United States effectively superseded the United Kingdom as the preeminent power in the West. A.J. P. Taylor once called the Second World War the War of British Succession. Who would succeed Britain? Well, the answer was America. So when, in his final review of the war in the House of Commons uh, in the early autumn of 1945, Churchill described the United States as being at the summit of the world, whereas Britain's power and influence, by contrast, were diminishing and declining, that was cause not only for rejoicing, but also in some ways cause for regret as well. And not for nothing would he label the last volume of his war memoirs, Triumph and Tragedy. Roosevelt's death in April 1945, which Churchill also depicted as being part of that tragedy, and Churchill's defeat in the general election three months later, brought to an end a personal friendship and a political association, which, with all its limitations, had for a time brought the two nations closer together than at any time since the end of the First World War. But as with the end of the First World War, it didn't last. As soon as the Second World War was over, the United States had cancelled Lend-Lease. The terms of the subsequent American loan were severe, despite all Jam uh, John Maynard Keynes' attempts to mitigate that. And the true extent of Britain's economic weakness soon became apparent. One consequence of which was that such continuing pretensions as it had to being a great power, which Churchill had pushed so hard, especially in the Mediterranean, were very soon given up. Within three years of the end of the Second World War, Britain had abandoned large parts of its position in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, in Greece, in Turkey, and in Palestine, handing it all over, as it were, to America, because the British could no longer afford it. And of course, and as many people have predicted, Churchill himself included, the end of the Indian Empire in 1947, uh, in some ways, spelt the end of Britain as a great global power. And this decline in British global influence which had been such a preoccupation of Churchill's, and the growing, um, how should one put it, the growing tensions, in a way, between the United States and the United Kingdom caused Churchill great dismay. Whatever may be said to the contrary, he lamented in the House of Commons, our relations with the United States have definitely become more distant and more difficult. America, he told Clark Clifford early in 1946, has now become the hope of the world. Britain has had its day. If I were to be born again, I'd want to be born an American. Nevertheless, despite this rather pessimistic uh, financial and geopolitical world, and although he was now in opposition, Churchill made two very significant contributions to Anglo-American relations in the immediate post-war years. The first was the speech which he delivered at the invitation of President Truman at Fulton, Missouri, in March 1946. In it, 
Churchill ranged widely over the contemporary international scene and set out to accomplish two particular yet also interconnected objectives. First, he sought to alert the United States to the threat which communist Russia was now presenting to freedom and democracy, given that an iron curtain had descended across the continent of Europe from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, and to enlist and urge America's support against Stalin as he had previously urged it against Hitler. Secondly, Churchill insisted that his country, the United Kingdom and the British Empire, was still a force to be reckoned with. And he reiterated the need for the continued fraternal association between the two great English-speaking peoples, who already enjoyed a special relationship which might ultimately lead to common citizenship. Together, Churchill insisted, Britain and America could impose their order on the world and in their continued and intensified collaboration lay the best, indeed the only, hope for the future. Here's that 1930 fantasy all over again. Churchill would always claim that he was speaking at Fulton as a private citizen. Yet despite their subsequent disclaimers, he delivered that speech with the prior knowledge and approval of both Truman and Attlee and in so doing, sought to make a public case for a hardening of policy towards Soviet Russia, which both governments were already contemplating, but were not yet ready to, sing to signal, either officially or publicly. So at the time, it did indeed seem as though Churchill's words brought about the fundamental change in American foreign policy, which followed uh, soon after, which soon became more robust towards Soviet Russia and more sympathetic towards the British Empire, which it now seemed more important to support as a means of containing communism in certain parts of the world than to dismantle as an affront uh, to democratic values. And the success of that speech, the attention it gathered, and to some extent the controversy it generated, meant that for Churchill himself, uh, the Iron Curtain speech at Fulton was a triumph and a tonic, as he re-emerged after his electoral defeat in the previous year as a world statesman with important things to say, no longer just about the Second World War, but about the present and about the future. And that, in turn, gave Churchill the confidence to begin and the framework within which to set uh, his account of the Second World War, about which he was by then beginning to think. Buoyed up by the impact of his Fulton Address, Churchill started serious work on his war memoirs almost as soon as he returned from Fulton to Britain. He had many reasons for wishing to write them, to make a great deal of much-needed money, to give his version of events. History, he's uh, alleged on one occasion to have said, history will not be kind to Neville Chamberlain, I know, because I'm going to write it. <laughs> and also to tell an extraordinary story, as only he could do, and indeed did. But there were other agendas, too. He was concerned to demonstrate, above all, the fundamental importance and, indeed, essential equality of the Anglo-American alliance. Accordingly, in his first volume, he placed altogether excessive stress on Roosevelt's ill-fated and ill-thought-out diplomatic initiative of early 1938. In the second volume, he exaggerated his close relationship with FDR, and in describing, for example, Lend-Lease as the most unselfish and unsordid financial act of any country in history, he made no mention of the widespread official opposition to America's harsh terms at the time. Thereafter, in subsequent volumes, he sought to minimize his frequent and very deep disagreements with the president and also with Eisenhower, supreme commander in Europe, and subsequently, of course, uh, president himself. I have, he told Eisenhower when he got to the sixth volume, taken great pains to ensure that it contains nothing which might imply that there was in those days any controversy or lack of confidence between us, which of course, in fact, there had been. Moreover, on those occasions when he was obliged to admit that the British and Americans did not always see things in the same way, Churchill suggested this was because he was wiser and more worldly than they were. Accordingly, 
when it came to the closing months of the war, Churchill insisted rather implausibly that he had all along divined Stalin's true and malevolent intentions in Eastern Europe, but that Roosevelt was by then too ill to do so by himself and was too trusting and naive to take his one true friend's advice. So, from this perspective, Churchill's history of the Second World War was indeed a history with a purpose. It set out to show that the Anglo-American alliance was essential to the peace and progress of the world, the big idea of the 1930s once again, and that it worked best when the Americans accepted the, gu the guidance which the British were uniquely equipped to provide and bestow and when they sought to support the British Empire rather than undermine it. By the time the concluding volumes were published, Churchill was back in Downing Street, and that was precisely the policy he intended once more to adopt and the agenda that he had embraced. For his aim, initially with Truman and subsequently with Eisenhower, was to recreate their old wartime collaboration in all its individual intimacy. In part because he believed the Americans would want to benefit from his accumulated wisdom and experience and his reputation as an unrivaled figure. Remember, Time magazine declared him to be the man of the half century in 1950. In part because he hoped to persuade them that the continuing greatness of Britain and its empire and of their vital necessity to the strength and future of the United States itself in part because such a renewed association might yet be the prelude to that more thoroughgoing union of the English-speaking peoples for which he still hankered, and in part because there might be a chance to broker a deal with the Russians at the very highest level, a deal which the detonation of the hydrogen bomb would make ever more urgent and necessary. Churchill was sure then that given the time to talk over a few family matters, as he put it, the Americans would take things from him that they would take from no one else. The problem was that neither Truman nor Eisenhower was remotely interested, and John Foster Dulles, who became Eisenhower's Secretary of State, was even less interested. Fond as they were of Churchill for what he had been and what he had done and what he had said, and much as they cherished their earlier associations with him. Both presidents were convinced that his greatest days were over, that physically and mentally he was not the man that he had once been, and that he was living too much in the past as a result. And so, although Churchill made three visits to America as peacetime prime minister with the agenda that I've just described, that agenda very largely went unrealized. It was impossible to conceal the fact that he himself was a diminished man and Britain a diminished nation, and that the so-called special relationship mattered much more to the United Kingdom than by this time it did to the United States. Neither president shared Churchill's view that most of the world problems could be solved by reviving the Anglo-American wartime partnership, and Eisenhower was distinctly unencouraging when Churchill volunteered to initiate discussions with the Russians and broker uh, Anglo-Russian conversations in the way he felt he had uh, in the latter stages of the Second World War. When I came to America, Churchill admitted to Lord Moran at the outset of one of these visits, having discovered that the chances of doing what he wanted were much less great than he had hoped. When I came to America before, it was as an equal. They have become so great and we are now so small poor England. Yet even at the very end of his premiership, in his final words to his cabinet colleagues, he continued to insist that Britain must never be separated from the Americans. Well, the rest of this story uh, is easily told, though in its way, as uh, we may talk about later, uh, we're still in some senses living through the consequences of some of these developments. Churchill's retirement was followed by the Eden Premiership and the Suez disaster, which temporarily sundered what was left of the Anglo-American alliance and set at naught Churchill's valedictory advice. He was deeply grieved by this development and wrote a personal letter to Eisenhower urging that relations be restored as soon as possible. He brought to belated completion his history of the English-speaking peoples, which he had laid aside early in 1940 and which ended at the close of the 19th century when Britain and America were to become allies in terrible but victorious wars which might themselves be the prelude 
to ultimate union. That's at the very end of volume four. This was little more than, as it were, pr prospective nostalgic fantasy. But when Churchill paid his last visit to the White House in 1959, at the personal invitation of President Eisenhower, he once again dwelt on the themes of the continuing greatness of Britain, the importance of the Anglo-American alliance, and the unity of the English-speaking peoples. It was his final transatlantic hurrah. He made two more brief visits to America. President Kennedy vainly urged him to come to the White House again, but by then, such things were beyond him. Nevertheless, there was a final flourish which was revealing in more ways than one. <clears throat> On the 9th of April, 1963, and by act of Congress, President Kennedy proclaimed Sir Winston Churchill to be an honorary citizen of the United States, thereby recognizing his outstanding achievements as a leader in war and peace and his steadfast loyalty to the American nation and people. Randolph Churchill, reading a speech that Churchill had written, uh, th uh, thanked uh, the American president for having received many kindnesses from the United States of America in the course of his life. But he added, the honor which you now accord me is without parallel. In this century of storm and tragedy, he continued, I contemplate with high satisfaction the constant factor of the interwoven and upward progress of our peoples. Mr. President, he concluded, your action illuminates the theme of the unity of the English-speaking peoples to which I have devoted a large part of my life. But even in these years of sunset and apotheosis, of which the bestowal of uh, honorary American citizenship was certainly one, the ambiguities of Churchill's ardent Anglo-Americanism persisted. And they were hinted at in another section of his speech, accepting honorary citizenship, which was very different in tone and substance from the majority of his appropriately gracious and appreciative remarks. For he was, he noted, the former prime minister of a great sovereign state. And he deliberately emphasized these robust attributes of national stature and historic independence in order, as he put it, to reject the view that Britain and the Commonwealth should now be relegated to a minor role in the world. In thus uh, reasserting the United Kingdom's claims to be taken seriously as a great power, Churchill was also explicitly rebutting the remarks made by Dean Asherson at West Point Military Academy several months before, when the former United States Secretary of State had opined that Great Britain had lost an empire and not yet found a role in the world. The Kennedy administration had taken pains to distance itself from Asherson's comments, but they had caused a furore in Britain, not so much because they were insulting, but rather because they were true. And indeed, to some degree, they are still true today. And working out uh, that trajectory that uh, Asherson, as it were, said ought to be worked out, but he wasn't sure what, uh, is, of course, something which lies at the root of our current concerns and preoccupation. But as Britain declined and as Churchill's life ebbed slowly away, his own popular reputation in America went from strength to strength. He was the most admired and venerated figure in America during the last decade of his life, and his death was front page news across the country. Churchill's great state funeral in London was in many ways a quintessentially Anglo-American occasion, with Eisenhower present as a personal guest of the family and with the Battle Hymn of the American Republic being sung at the service in St. Paul's Cathedral. But there was a revealingly discordant note, for the official American representation at the funeral was disappointingly meager. President Lyndon Johnson was unable to attend because he was unwell. Because he was unwell, he was also unwilling to send Vice President Humphrey in his stead, and Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, who did fly to London, had to pull out at the last minute because he caught flu. There were some who thought that this was belated American retaliation for Churchill's refusal to attend Roosevelt's obsequies 20 years before. In fact, there was no such conspiracy. Two unlucky illnesses and a serious misjudgment by Johnson were all it took. But he was much criticized as a result by the Anglo-American lobby in the United States. And thereafter, he dispatched Hubert Humphrey so often to overseas funerals that he became America's full-time global mourner in chief. This glitch on a day of grandeur reminds us 
that in death as in life, Churchill's relations with America were a characteristic combination of grandiloquence and grittiness, rhetoric and realism, hope and disappointment. In his years of maturity and greatness, he came to believe passionately in the shared historic destinies of the English-speaking peoples. He relished his collaboration with Roosevelt as an elevated encounter between great men and kindred spirits, and as a fitting prelude to that much-desired eventual outcome. And after 1945, he still pursued the special relationship as the means whereby Britain might influence America and America might support Britain. Yet for all that, Churchill was always aware that a very thin line divided Anglo-American amity from Anglo-American rivalry. And for the first 50 years of his life, he was at least as suspicious of the United States as he was captivated by it. And those suspicions were never wholly allayed between 1940 and 1945, and with good cause. In the Second World War, he saw the American alliance as the essential means whereby Hitler and Hirohito might be defeated and British greatness safeguarded. But while he achieved the first of those objectives triumphantly and did all he could to bring about the second, he soon came to realize that America and Russia would be the leading post-war powers in what would become a bipolar world, with Britain a much diminished nation and that there was nothing he could do in the end to prevent that. And although after 1945, he took every opportunity to urge and celebrate the union of the English-speaking peoples, in his heart of hearts, he knew the great, that that great cause, as he had defined it and championed it, was lost. All of which was well caught, I think, uh, in some words that he spoke uh, very late in life, which are uh, authenticated by at least two of his friends, which must surely amount to some of the saddest words ever spoken by a great man in extremis when he declared on more than one occasion, I have achieved so much to have achieved in the end nothing. It is then scarcely surprising that Churchill's Anglo-American legacy is itself an appropriately ambiguous one. In the United States, the Churchill cult continues to thrive, and he is dutifully quoted by American leaders more frequently than any other figure, though it's fair to say that in recent years he's been very much hijacked by those on the right. And in Britain, subsequent prime ministers have sought to follow Churchill to the White House, where they believe their greater energy and or superior wisdom and experience carries a wholly and rightly disproportionate weight with whoever is living on Pennsylvania Avenue. Thus, Macmillan with Kennedy, Thatcher with Reagan, and Blair with George H.W. Bush have all sought to recreate and have claimed they were seeking to do that uh, in some form or other, that greatest of all alliances embodied in Churchill and Roosevelt. Yet, there have been and are others who denounce this transatlantic Churchill cult for being based on nothing except snobbery and condescension in the United States and delusion and nostalgia in the United Kingdom. From this perspective, Americans' veneration for Churchill is just one more sign that they see Britain as a quaint, class-bound, past its society, an anachronistic amalgam uh, of masterpiece theatre, Downton Abbey and Ruritania. <laughs> While, so this argument goes on, a succession of British prime ministers have wielded far less influence in Washington than they claimed, and so this argument continues, their time would have been much better spent pursuing Britain's true future destiny in Europe, rather than indulging in transatlantic fantasies of continued global greatness, which were already out of date in 1955 and perhaps even 10 years before that. These are, no doubt, excessively oversimplified and over-dichotomized versions of post-Churchill Anglo-American relations. And they underestimate many of the different levels at which Anglo-American conversations and relations still continue. But it cannot be denied that the transatlantic connection has not always been a happy or harmonious one. It took the British a long time to recover from what they saw as America's betrayal and perfidy at the time of Suez. There were serious tensions later on because of East Coast funding of the Irish Republican Army, which helped prolong the troubles in Northern Ireland. And Ronald Reagan sent the troops into the British colony of Grenada without even deigning to consult Margaret Thatcher, much to her rage. 
nor have such irritations, to put it its, its mildest, been confined to the British side. Often after 1945, the Americans were called upon at short notice to assume great, greater great power burdens, which the British could no longer afford to discharge, as in the case uh, of Turkey and Greece uh, in the mid to late 1940s. Lyndon Johnson never forgave Harold Wilson for refusing to send British troops to fight alongside the Americans in Vietnam. There were many people in the Reagan administration who were strongly opposed to the covert and indispensable help which Caspar Weinberger gave the British during the Falklands War. And for most of that conflict, Reagan himself sat on the fence and only came down on the British side very, very late in the day. Because, of course, he was concerned about America's own relations with Latin America. Of course, it can be argued that like any marriage, the Anglo-American special relationship has had its inevitable share of ups and downs. But unlike most modern, modern marriages, the Anglo-American alliance has been intrinsically asymmetrical since about 1944, and it's become more so year by year since then. For as America's global role has expanded, while Britain's has diminished, the allure of continued transatlantic camaraderie has been much greater in London than in Washington. Since the Second World War, the American State Department has pointedly refused to employ the term special relationship and has constantly urged that Britain should integrate itself more closely with continental Europe instead of hankering after privileged and outdated transatlantic treatment. And only occasionally have American presidents actually sought British military support. Not because of its real significance, nor out of any particular fondness for the special relationship, but rather as a cover for what might otherwise appear unacceptably unilateralist American action. That was why Lyndon Johnson requested British troops for Vietnam and why George H.W. Bush wanted British troops in Iraq. Harold Wilson said no, and he was right. Tony Blair said yes, and with all due respect to another honorary fellow of this college, I have to say, I think he was wrong. Thank you.